Christianity was well developed before we entered the picture. We who are accustomed to sanctuaries and organs, to well-staffed nurseries for our children and staff in the office to answer the questions, find it a little bit difficult to stand in the muddy sandals of those who first encountered Jesus by the Sea of of Galilee. Climate-controlled worship spaces, amplified voices, and carefully ordered worship is, at best, foreign to those who would have first been called. It was just Jesus. Just Jesus, as Mark tells the story. Just Jesus, who has now been baptized and is triumphant after 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. Just Jesus, no religious trappings as he walked through Galilee. And as he walks and as he talks, Jesus quickly begins to create a community. We can't know who he passed by or why those he called responded immediately. We can't know what others were thinking or even what their hopes were, but there are some things we can know. We know that Jesus issued a compelling invitation. It was an invitation to be part of something much larger than oneself. And we know that the invitation was issued without determining IQ scores or conducting background checks. It seems that Jesus wasn't that much interested in one's origins or their current connections. None were called by virtue of who they were. Today's gospel text is a familiar one, I expect, to most of us, because we remember, we remember that picture we have of Jesus calling his first disciples. Follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Now, it's interesting to me that Jesus begins this process by calling pairs of people. This is not an individual invitation. He calls Simon and Andrew, and then he calls Zebedee's sons, James and John. And almost as soon as they have fallen in step with him, Jesus tells these fisher folk that now they will be fishing for people. There is the immediate expectation for those he he has called and those who are following that there are more people to come. They who have been mending nets and using them to catch what they will eat will now cast an even larger net. Soon there will be more who answer the call, who respond to the invitation, and who become a part of this community of God's people. There will be the rest of the twelve, and then there will be the Syrophoenician woman, and the woman at the well, and Mary Magdalene, and Martha, and a host, dare I say, a holy host, of others who are invited either by Jesus himself or by one of the invited followers, or those who are nudged by the Holy Spirit to share life in the beloved kingdom. Jesus makes it happen. With humble beginnings, Jesus creates a community of people who commit their lives to him and to each other. But we're not blind to how the story will play out. You know what's going to happen. Within that first community, there's Peter, who denies Jesus three times, and then there's Judas, who betrays him. None of the first four who are called by Jesus will be found with him on the cross. 
And along the way, they will bicker, they will argue, they will jockey for position, and they will turn away from what is right. They will fall asleep when Jesus begs them to stay awake with him in Gethsemane. They will often lean toward judgment and the easy way out instead of clinging to the love and forgiveness to which they have been called. Even so, this is the community of God's people. And by God's grace alone, God will find a way. God will find a way to use those who seem to take one step forward and two steps backward along the journey of discipleship. God knows, Jesus knows, even we know. We can't do discipleship very well on our own. In fact, we can't even do life very well on our own. We can't live out our faith alone. We won't be generous without the encouragement of someone else. We will not pursue peace unless we have the support of others. We can't love our neighbors in the way we love ourselves unless we have company, company on the journey. We simply won't be the most faithful of discipleships by ourselves. We can't feed the hungry alone and we won't visit the sick and those who are in prison unless someone gives us a holy push in that direction. Left to our own devices, we will ultimately flounder and fail at the things that we say matter most of all to us. We need mentors and peers. We need colleagues and friends in the faith. We need those who will challenge us to be more like Christ, we need those who will call us out when we hoard the very gifts God has given us. We need those who will help strengthen us when we are weak, and those who will pick us up and dust us off when we fail miserably to be faithful. We need others to push us, to push us when we have lost our zeal in the quest for justice. We need each other. We need someone to pray with, to sing with, and God knows we need someone to pray for us. We need someone with whom to wrestle with the truth of the gospel and what it meant not just then, but now in our own lives. Sometimes we need someone to pull us aside and whisper, you know, I believe this is what God is doing in your life. We need to be part of a community of faith. It's easy to feel alone in these days. The cold and snow sap our energy and keep us at home too long. Darkness comes early and stays late. Family is always too far away. The chair of a beloved spouse is now too long empty. Work isn't as meaningful or even as much fun as it once was, and neither is retirement, really. It's easy to feel alone in these days. A frightening diagnosis comes out of the blue. College acceptance letters are delayed and scholarship offers are disappointing. Public discourse is angry and divisive. Grief lingers. Rhetoric is confusing and hurtful. It seems that there are far more losers than there are winners. The gospel is grossly misrepresented by those who do not understand, or worse yet, who don't care. Too often it seems that hate triumphs and evil will have its way. 
but we are followers of Jesus. The one who called us is always with us. God will never abandon us. We are three weeks into the Epiphany season. We mark this season with light, and we understand it as a time when God's power and purpose are disclosed. And of course, we know in a grand and global way, God's power and purpose are disclosed with the birth of the Christ child who came to save not just us, but the world. And the visit of the gift-bearing magi to that baby and his family reminds us of God's universal power. In smaller and more gentle ways, Epiphany reminds us of God's power and purpose in the midst of our daily life in the world. The command of Jesus to follow me means much more than following blindly after someone. The invitation of Jesus to follow him is transforming. It means that we are part of something much larger than ourselves. The community of God's people, that's us, is a gift. And in this beloved community, we experience the living Christ together. We will remind our fellow disciples that they are not alone, and sometimes we will need them to remind us of that truth. We will accompany each other even when the going is hard. We will love one another even when we disagree. And we will pray for one another even when we are uncertain about how we should pray. We will challenge one another to deeper discipleship and more faithful living. We will continually search the scriptures together for God's eternal truth. And we will work together for the common good of all God's people. Together we will invest our lives in this beloved community. And we will trust the Spirit of God active and empowering us. And through this community, we will work together to be a loving and authentic witness to God's love for the world. In that way, others will get a glimpse of light on their way to understanding God's power and purpose. Even together, we will sometimes falter and fail. Like the first of those who dropped their nets to follow Jesus, we will sometimes doze when Jesus implores us to stay awake. We will, on occasion, ignore the nudging of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness and love may be hard to come by. And we will still sometimes want to hoard what God has given us. And sometimes we will choose conflict over peace. We are still both sinner and saint. We will be human in this community, yet we are called beloved by God. And as part of God's beloved community, we know that God will not, will never abandon us. We will never be alone. God will meet us where we are, God will urge us forward. God will give us strength to be the beloved community. And in the end, God will forgive and redeem us in this time and forevermore. Amen.